The time is at hand. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order. But I am telling you right now. We need a great reset. And this, this is, is extremely, extremely dangerous, dangerous to our democracy. democracy. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. Welcome to In Dark Places. I'm your Huckleberry, Junebug Fugit. You know what bugs me? When I'm at work, I bring out new fresh meat out to the meat case, and it never fails. The customers always come running to see what I've got in my little cart thing full of meat. And there'll be some guys say, Look here, Ed, now he's got some fresh hamburger. Because the hamburger that I have in my little cart that I'm getting ready to put out in the case is just so much better than that that I made 20 minutes ago. I don't get people. They really bug me. And then I'll be out in front of the meat case wearing my little red apron. And someone will ask me, Do you work here? <laughs> yes, I do. People drive me crazy. This week on the show, in honor of my time spent in the city between the lakes, we're going to be having some hot dog sauce. Translated, we're going to read a bunch of random creepy stories. So, sit back, get warm, and enjoy. This is Mr. Haunted with this week's Cryptid Corner. And we have a sponsor. It's Old El Paso. Out in the West Texas town of El Paso. For generations, the people of El Paso have been creating some of the best tasting Mexican food using their traditional recipes for savory tacos, mouth-watering burritos, and sizzling fajitas. But you don't have to go to El Paso to get the real taste. Old El Paso taco, burrito, and fajita kits have come to you. Old El Paso. The real taste from the real place. And coincidentally, this story is out of Horizon City, Texas. El Paso. So, more than two years ago, Cecilia Montanez saw the creature for the first time. More than seven feet tall with faded dark brown fur and standing in the desert near East Lake Boulevard and Darrington Road. I saw a big gorilla-like thing walking towards the desert, Martinez said. Martinez said she and other Horizon City residents have witnessed a large Bigfoot-type creature lurking in the desert, usually near East Lake and near Lake El Paso. While others, including law enforcement officers, Believe the sightings are part of a hoax. Montanez said what she and other people have witnessed is true. The legend of the monster goes back to the early 1970s, but no actual evidence has been found, according to many longtime Horizon City residents. Montanez, a retired secretary, moved from East El Paso to Horizon City three years ago. She said she has seen the creature on two occasions. The last sighting took place near her home last October. Montanez said that after the first sighting, she remembered an article that ran in the September 20th, 1975 edition of the El Paso Times. The article reported that three teenagers saw a gorilla-like creature near the Horizon City golf course. Bill Rutherford a former deputy with the El Paso County Sheriff's Department, said in the article that he did see a track, but that it appeared to have been dug. Someone had to have made those tracks, Rutherford said in a recent phone interview. 
There's a lot of people that were very upset, but it never bothered me. I didn't think it was real. Rutherford was a deputy until 1979 and in 18... I'm sorry, 1988 became Horizon City's first police chief. He retired after 10 years and remembers that although he didn't believe the teen's stories, he felt obligated to investigate. I was a deputy sheriff, so I was regulated to do something. I never saw it. I thought it was a hoax. We've had reports before of meteorites landing in the desert, but nothing about Bigfoot's. Aguilar remembered hearing about a hermit who may have lived in the mountains near Horizon City in the early 1970s. He had long hair and he was unshaven. A lot of hunters at one point found a little cave and found old cans and like he had been living off the land. Although Montanez maintains the creature lives in caverns that exist underneath Horizon City, Phil Goodell, a geology professor at the University of Texas at El Paso, says no such caverns exist. Horizon City Police Chief Tony Aguilar has been the town's chief for almost two years and uh, said he doesn't recall any reports of Bigfoot sightings. But Montanez said she got some of her information on the creature from at least one law enforcement official who has investigated the creature sightings and developed a profile. He said the mothers go out to find food and that they nurse their young just like we do. Aguilar said if anyone reported seeing the creature to police, we would look into it and take it seriously with whatever information we had to work on. Montanez described the creatures as having red glowing eyes like cats, she said, and as being vegetarians. Since El Paso is mostly desert with no vegetation, Montanez said the creatures suck the blood out of small animals and eat their organs. Witnesses of the Horizon City creature claim it is between seven and eight feet tall with very broad shoulders and an elongated head. Montanez, who claims to have seen the creature twice, says the creature has very short hair and it's a faded brownish maroon color. Montanez said the creatures also have a mouth that resembles that of a bulldog. Many witnesses say the creature can be seen near Lake El Paso late at night drinking water. Others believe They have heard the creatures humming as they drive through East Lake Boulevard or know the creatures are around because of their strong odor. So that's the Horizon City Monster. For generations, the people of El Paso have been creating some of the best tasting Mexican food using their traditional recipes for savory tacos, Mouth-watering burritos and sizzling fajitas. Thank you, old El Paso. Hey, I could go for some burritos right now. I recorded this story on July 17th, 2022. And as far as I can tell, I never did use it on the show. I don't believe I did. I don't know. If I did, I apologize. You're going to hear it again. <laughs> Hunters in New Mexico encounter eerie hooded beings in Vanishing Circus Tent by Tim Banal. Thanks, Tim. In a truly bizarre story out of New Mexico, two men claim that they had a close encounter with what may have been a UFO resembling a circus tent and its alien occupants during a recent hunting trip. Josh Brinkley and Daniel Lasaro told the Santa Fe New Mexican that their puzzling experience occurred over Labor Day weekend on a mountain known as Cerro de la Hoya near Taos. The duo had been camping at the site for the start of bow hunting season with the hopes of bagging some elk, but they wound up coming home with a far more fantastic story to tell. The weirdness began on the morning of September 1st, and who knows what year this is, but it was September 1st. 
when the two men were on opposite sides of a field waiting for elk to emerge from the nearby tree line. According to Brinkley, he grew bored with this tactic after about three hours and chose to start hiking through the woods in search of the animals and eventually wound up at the top of the mountain. It was there that he allegedly spotted what initially appeared to be two people standing side by side, staring right at him about 35 feet away. Brinkley walked across the field between them with the intention of speaking to the two strangers, but when he briefly looked away to maneuver around a bush, they had vanished. Looking back on the encounter, the bow hunter recognized that there was something odd about the duo. The shape that would be like their heads, it looked like they had huge hoods on, he recalled. It looked like two ribbons coming off either side to a point at the top and bottom in the middle of the oval was just gray. The hunter's trip took an even stranger turn the following afternoon when Brinkley and the Sorrow grew frustrated by the fact that they had yet to see a single elk and decided to drive around in their jeep looking for them. Along the way, they soon realized not only were there no elk in the area, but it appeared as if all of the wildlife had fled the scene. The reason for this may have revealed itself when the men noticed a puzzling, out-of-place structure, for lack of a better term, about a quarter mile away from them. It's this big tent structure, like a circus tent, 50, 60 feet tall, Wrinkley recounted to the newspaper. Coming off to the left of it was this long building, almost like what you would build for an archery lane for target practice. It was a third the height, but really long, maybe a couple hundred feet. Amazingly, much like the two mysterious people that he had seen the previous morning, the baffling building disappeared during a brief moment when their vehicle went down a hill and they had lost sight of it. The incident proved to be so powerful that the pair continued driving around the area until dark with the hopes of seeing the structure again, but it never returned. I just know it was real, Brinkley declared. It was huge and white and then gone. As one can imagine, the wondrous weekend has left the duo scratching their heads as to what they may have encountered on the mountain, asserting that they were complete. What in the world was that? <laughs> I don't know. It'll be interesting to play that back and see what in the world that was. Asserting that the pair were completely sober during the trip, the pair conceded that people will likely doubt their story, but they insist that it really happened. Given the sizable nature of the structure as well as how both it and the beings disappeared in an instant, the hunter's report has stirred speculation that they had some kind of encounter with a UFO and its occupants. For his part, Brinkley seemed to agree, noting that the experience has made him a believer in the phenomenon. Meanwhile, the sorrow wasn't quite ready to go that far and instead simply marveled that I've never seen anything that big just disappear. I recorded that out in my beloved Jeep. Did you catch that weird popping noise? Completely. I don't know what that was. I still haven't figured it out. Maybe you guys know. Wish I had that Jeep now. I'm sitting here stranded in five inches of snow at the house. I can't even get out of the house right now. That same night on July... 17th, I was down at my dad's house, and I saw some kind of a shadow figure run by the window out in his yard by the swimming pool. So, two odd occurrences in one day. Here's another story I've been hanging on to for a while. I've got a few of those in this episode. This one is from December 1st, 2023, and I guarantee that it hasn't been on the show yet. I was the store manager of a nationwide mall, computer, later gaming store. This was long before GameStop and cell phones. We were located on the left side facing the middle of the mall 
with JC Penney's to the left at the end. This detail plays into what happened. My ex-wife is a strikingly beautiful Latina woman. She was only 20 and my daughter one and a half at the time. Unfortunately, fortunately for us, we had very beautiful babies. They almost look like dolls. The reason I say this is my daughter attracted way too much attention as a baby. We stopped going out in public because people were constantly approaching us and trying to touch her. It's a Sunday. I would work the whole day since it was a short day. The three of us would go to work. My ex-wife would dress our daughter and herself up and make a big day of it. She liked to shop and wonder for the day coming back to have lunch. Being the manager, I took long breaks as well. And probably took more of the money than all your other employees too. <laughs> A little hostility, I'm sorry. Everything is going along fine, like any other Sunday. I go out to give her some money and my spidey street senses start going crazy. I look to the left and see a man intently looking at my wife and our daughter. I meet his gaze. He doesn't look away. We had had a huge wedding with 200 plus guests. I asked my wife if she knew the person staring at her. We both look up and he was gone. Couldn't have been two to three seconds since I last looked at him. There was something strange about him. I remember to this day he was dressed in a dark gray suit with a dark gray overcoat. Not to trouble her. I told her not to worry about it. We had lunch and we took the long way back to the store. We stopped by mall security. I introduced her to the security guys who had become good buddies. I pulled them aside and told them what had happened. They were concerned. We stopped by the info booth and I tell the person working there to let me know if she sees him. My ex-wife loves to shop at JC Penney's. <laughs> As previously noted, before she goes in, I tell her about the man in the gray suit. She let me know that she'll keep an eye out for him. There's a call on the store phone. An employee tells me it's the phone. I'm like, yeah, I heard it ring. He tells me he needs some help. He pulls me aside and says, it's your wife. And she sounds scared. I jump on the phone. She tells me that the man I had described has been following her for over a half an hour. When he had first showed up, she said he was reaching for our daughter. I immediately called security. They come up the middle with my employees standing watch on the entrance to J.C. Penney's. I go out into the parking garage, which was no more than 50 feet away. Only two entrances into the store, front and back. Lots of emergency exits on the parking garage side. So the only entrance not covered was in the front. Luck would have it, a police officer had pulled someone over from the street and was in the front parking lot. By this point, I don't want the gentleman to go away. I want him caught. Everyone starts converging on the store. He's got nowhere to go, right? They walk to the station where my wife is surrounded by the store manager, several employees, and they have our daughter behind the counter. The police officer had been alerted. All security escorts, both of them out of the store to me. We put them in our car and they drive straight to her mother's. They continue to search the store, every nook and cranny. He was never found. To this day, I can remember every detail but the detail that sticks out the most, his eyes were coal black. Breaking news. Are there super tall alien beings that are caught on video in Brazil roaming around the hillside? Well, TMZ sent us this story. More mysterious video of what appears to be super tall human-like beings walking among us. And at this time, folks are claiming 
that there are 10 foot tall aliens down in Brazil. You got to see these videos from Ilha do Mel, an island off the coast of Brazil, where locals claim they saw at least two tall and mysterious figures standing on a hilltop. It's hard to gauge how far away these clips were shot from, but whatever's out there sure looks big, and it's pretty crazy. The woman who took the video says it's pretty much impossible for humans to reach that part of the hill where the creatures are, and she says the beings are way bigger than people. At one point, you start to see them on the move, walking around. The sighting comes only days after an incident in Miami where conspiracy theorists claim video shows a tall gray creature walking through an outdoor mall in the middle of a massive police response. As we first told you, cops in Miami said that video doesn't show a creature, but rather a human shadow, and the cops were responding to a huge fight. The Brazilian government is going a different route, 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 route to brush this incident off, posting on social media. Surreal! What happened on Ilha do Mel? Uh, some person, I don't know how to pronounce their name. Uh, it's another story, and even strange things, strange beings came to check it out. And you, will you be left out? In other words, they're trying to play this off as a hoax, or not what people think. It's the eye of the beholder, we suppose. We say this through these, uh, though these sightings are becoming more frequent. And at some point, someone might get something on camera that's impossible to deny, as much ado about nothing. Until then, here's more breadcrumbs for the unknown. The truth is out there, y'all. I'm still having real bad problems with my eyes. Excuse the uh, mispronunciations and such. Back to you, Junebug. Indian Village on Edge, over Shadow Entity, Sightings and Strange Home Disturbances, by Tim Banal. Thanks, Tim. Panic has gripped a village in India, as several residents say they have experienced strange disturbances at their homes, and two witnesses claim to have seen a shadow entity that some believe to be behind the mayhem. The eerie case reportedly began shortly after the start of the new year when someone or something began knocking on multiple houses in the community of Kampung Kippus. The peculiar phenomenon quickly took an unsettling turn following an incident at the home of resident Eslinda Hassam. We heard a sound, she recalled. It'd be funny if that's all she said, but she goes on to say, like something had dropped or fell outside the house. When she subsequently looked outside to find the source of the noise, the homeowner was astounded by what she saw. According to Hassam, lurking outside her home was what she described as a shadow entity crawling along the ground. Initially, I thought that it was an illusion that my eyes were playing tricks on me, she said. And then when I saw it again, it looked right at me. It got up and ran toward the main road and disappeared. Following the unnerving encounter, Hassam claims her home has been targeted by the mysterious phantom, including one incident wherein it seemed as if the being was trying to scratch its way into the residence. Her tale was echoed by resident Mariam Jahit, who shared a similarly creepy account, claiming that her home has been struck by the visitor five times. She recounted how, We heard the front gate of the house being shaken during the most recent incident, and when her daughter looked to see what was causing the commotion, Jahit says she saw the shadow entity lurking outside the house. Chillingly, the mysterious figure managed to somehow flee the scene, despite the home being surrounded by family members, relatives, and other local folk who are attempting to get to the bottom of the weird disturbances. Residents are now calling on authorities to investigate the situation and hopefully bring peace to the village by putting a stop 
to the inexplicable haunting that has plagued them since the start of the year. The wailing of the banshee to announce death is a well-known part of Irish folklore. One night, early in 1979, Irene McCormick of Andover, Hampshire, England, was lying in bed when she heard what she later described as the most awful wailing noise. She was alone in the house at the time and was in a melancholy mood, for her mother was close to death in Winchester Hospital. When she heard the wailing, she nearly fell out of bed. I got up, shaking, and went downstairs. The dog was running around and round in the living room, whimpering. He would not settle. So Mrs. McCormick took him upstairs to the bedroom, where, after the wailing died away, they both lay waiting for daybreak. With the dawn came a police message for Mrs. McCormick. She was to go to the bedside of her mother. When she arrived at the hospital, she found her mother in a coma. She stayed with her until her mother died a short time later. When the funeral was over and the household had returned to normal, Mrs. McCormick told her husband and children what she had heard. Although she is not Irish, her husband is. He suggested that she had heard the Banshee. Many of the family laughed at this, says Mrs. McCormick in a letter to the unexplained. Thanks, unexplained. They probably thought I was going mad, but I hope I never hear anything like that again. Pronounced as it is spelled, the word banshee is derived from the Irish Gaelic bean shidi, meaning woman of the fairies. Her mournful cry is said to foretell death. According to tradition, she has long red hair and combs it mermaid-like as she keens outside the family home of those about to die. She is rarely heard or seen by the doomed person. The banshee has her origins deep in Irish legend. She willed for ancient heroes such as King Connor McNessa, Finn McCool, and the great Brian Baru whose victory over the Vikings in 1014 broke their power in Ireland. Most recently, residents of the Cork village in Sam's Cross claimed to have heard the eerie voice of the Banshee when Michael Collins, commander-in-chief of the Irish Free State Army, was killed in an ambush in 1922 during the Irish Civil War. In the late 1960s, the Irish psychical researcher Sheila St. Clair produced a radio program for the BBC on the Banshee and even allowing for Irish exaggeration. Some of the accounts were chillingly convincing. A baker from Kerry told of an uncomfortable night that he and his colleagues had spent while baking bread ready for the morning delivery. It started low at first and then it mounted up to a crescendo. There was definitely some human element in the voice. The door to the bakery where I worked was open too, and the men stopped to listen. Well, it rose, as I told you, to a crescendo, and you could almost make out one or two Gaelic words in it. Then gradually it went away slowly. Well, we talked about it for a few minutes, and at last, coming on to morning, about five o'clock, one of the bread servers came in and says to me, I'm afraid they'll need you to take out the cart, for I just got word of the death of an aunt of mine. It was at his cart that the banshee had keened. On the same program, an elderly man from County Down tried to describe the death cry in more detail. It was a mournful sound, he said. It would have put ye in mind of them old yard cats on the wall, but it wasn't cats. I know it meself. I thought it was a bird in torment or something. A mournful cry it was. And then it was going a wee bit further back and further until it died 
away altogether. Although Bin Sahid means literally fairy woman, most folklorists classify the banshee as a spirit rather than a fairy, in the sense of one of the Irish little people. According to mythology, the banshee cries at the deaths of fairy kings, too. Some of the older Irish families, the O'Briens and the O'Neills, for example, traditionally regarded the banshee almost as a personal guardian angel, silently watching over the fortunes of the family, guiding its members away from danger, and then performing the final service of keening for their departed souls. A county Antrim man told Sheila St. Clair his interpretation of the Banshee's role. An interpretation, incidentally, that may account for the rarity of the noisy spirit nowadays. He claimed that centuries ago, certain of the more piteous clans had been blessed with guardian spirits because these celestial beings were not normally to express themselves in human terms yet became involved with the family in their charge. They were allowed to show their deep feelings only when one of their charges died. The result was the banshee howl. However, said the atrium man, with the gradual fall from grace of the Irish over the years, only the most God-fearing families were privileged to have a personal banshee today. This theory may please a businessman from Boston, USA, who wrote to the author of this article some years ago, claiming that the Banshee, like other creatures of European folklore, had crossed the Atlantic. This man, who used the pseudonym of James O'Barry, is descended from an Irish family that originally arrived in Massachusetts in 1848. It was as a very small boy that he first heard the Banshee. I was lying in bed one morning when I heard a weird noise, like a demented woman crying. It was spring, and outside the window the birds were singing. The sun was shining, and the sky was blue. I thought for a moment or two that a wind had sprung up, but a glance at the barely stirring trees told me that this was not so. I went down to breakfast, and there was my father sitting at the kitchen table with tears in his eyes. I had never seen him weep before. My mother told me that they had just heard by telephone that my grandfather had died in New York. Although he was an old man, he was as fit as a fiddle, and his death was unexpected. It was some years before O'Barry learned the legend of the Banshee and then he recalled the wailing noise on the death of his grandfather. In 1946 he heard it, in a very different circumstance, for the second time. He was an administrative officer serving with the USAAF in the Far East when one day at 6 a.m. he was awakened by a low howl. He was terrified, but he says, that time I was instantly aware of what it was. I sat bolt upright, and the hair on the back of my neck prickled. The noise got louder, rising and falling like an air raid siren. Then it died away, and I realized that I was terribly depressed. I knew my father was dead. A few days later, I had a notification that this was so. Old Mary was to hear the voice again, seventeen years later on what he considers the most remarkable occasion of all. He was in Toronto, Canada, by himself, enjoying a combined holiday and business trip. Again, I was in bed, reading the morning papers, when the dreadful noise was suddenly filling my ears. I thought of my wife, my young son, and my two brothers, and I thought, good God, don't let it be one of them. For some reason, I knew it wasn't. The date was November 22, 1963, the time shortly after noon, and the Irish Banshee was wailing the death of an acquaintance of O'Barry's, President John F. Kennedy. If the Irish have their Banshee, 
one could reasonably expect their close Celtic cousins, the Scots, to have a version of their own. It is not so, however, although most clans, at some time or another, have boasted a personal harbinger of death. The nearest thing to the banshee recorded in Scottish folklore is the Death Woman, who sits on westward running streams on the west coast of Scotland, washing the clothes of those about to die, and the Highland Red Fisherman, a robed and hooded apparition who sits angling for fish. To see him is itself the warning of death. The Ewans of the Isle of Mole, Argyllshire, preserve a curious legend concerning their own death spirit. In the 16th century, Egon, a chin big Ewan of the Little Head, had a serious quarrel with his father in law, the Maclean. In 1538, both sides collected for a showdown. The evening before the battle, Ewan was walking when he met an old woman washing a bundle of blood stained shirts in a stream. Ewan knew that she was a death woman and that the shirts belonged to those who would die in the morning. Rather boldly, he asked if his own shirt was among them, and she said that it was. She told him that if his wife offered him bread and cheese with her own hand, he would live and be victorious. His wife failed to do so. Ewan, demoralized, rode to defeat, and at the height of the battle, a swinging lock arbor axe cut his head clean from his shoulders. His horse galloped off down Glen Moor, the headless rider still upright in the saddle. According to the present, Ewan of Loch Bowie, the dead chief became his own clan's death warning, and his headless body on his galloping horse has been seen three times within living memory before a family death. The vision is also said to herald serious illness in the family. Another celebrated Scottish death warning involves the phantom drummer of Cortachi Castle, Tayside, seat of the Earls of Arley. One story says that he was a Leslie come to intercede for a truce with his clan's enemies, the Ogilvies, the family name of Arley, and that he was killed before he could deliver his message. A more romantic version is that he was a drummer with a Highland regiment and lover of a 15th century Lady Arley. He was caught by the Earl and thrown from a turret window for well-attested accounts from the 19th century indicate that the phantom carried out its warning task efficiently. In the 1840s, the drummer was heard by members of the household before the death of the Countess of Arley. The Earl married again shortly afterward, and in 1848 had a house party. The guests, including a Miss Margaret Delrymple, during dinner on her first night, Miss Delrymple remarked on the curious music she had heard coming from below her window as she dressed. The sound of a fife, followed by drumming. Both her host and hostess paled. After dinner, one of the other guests explained the legend. The following morning, Miss Delrymple's maid, Anne Day, was alone in the bedroom attending to her mistress's clothes. She had heard nothing of the drummer story, so was surprised when she heard her coach draw up in the yard below, accompanied by the sound of drumming. When she realized that the yard was empty, though the drumming carried on, she became hysterical. The following day her mistress heard the sound again and decided she had had enough. Shortly afterward, Lady Arley died in Brighton, leaving a note stating that she was sure her own death had been signaled by the drumming. 
1853, several people heard and reported the drummer again. Just before the death of the Earl, and in 1881, two relatives told of hearing the prophetic sound while staying at Cortecki during Lord Arley's absence in America. Some days later, news of his death reached them. In the case of both the Banshee and the Scottish clan's death warnings, there are dozens of instances of people having heard or seen these harbingers of disaster. Laying aside the unlikely possibility that all of them are either lying or exaggerating, can we explain such irrational events in any rational way? Some psychologists, including Carl Jung, have evolved theories of what they term collective unconsciousness, a sort of inherited storehouse of memories of mankind's experiences passed on through a process from psyche to psyche. In the case of the Banshee, Sheila St. Clair says, I would suggest that just as we inherit physical characteristics, we also inherit memory cells, and that those of us with strong tribal lineages riddled with intermarriage have the Banshee as part of an inherited memory. The symbolic form of a weeping woman may well be stamped on our racial consciousness. And just as our other levels of consciousness are not answerable to the limitations of time in our conscious mind, so a particular part of the mind throws up a symbolic hereditary pattern that has in the past been associated with tragedy in the tribe, be it woman, hare, or bird, as a kind of subliminal four-minute warning so that we may prepare ourselves for that tragedy. And we are woefully out of time for the show this week. Thanks for listening. Thanks as always, Jimmy Haunted. We'll see you again right here next week or somewhere along those lines. Be careful out there. God bless.